So um, I'll start with you, Michael. Um, you are the CEO and the co-founder of Twice. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, Julian is the global director of business management of battery um, at uh, BASF. Thanks for joining. And um, Jennifer is the director of QM Operations Europe at Svolt Energy. Thank you for being here with us. Um, as usual, we will have the same format that you're already used to. Um, we will um, give our experts um, the opportunity to give us some short introductory statements. Um, then we would like to post a question to you guys through a poll. Please use the app for that and also, as um, you're very used to, also use the app for giving us questions that we will try to answer in the time that we have. We will be going until 3.45, <coughs> so there should be plenty of room for your questions. Um, I'm very happy, I'm actually delighted to see so many of you here. Um, I think that uh, at this time of the afternoon of the second conference day, um, the people that are here in the room for the panel discussions are the ones that are highly motivated and truly interested in the minute details of this topic. Um, uh, so please take advantage of the experts that are here. Um, so to start out with, um, Michael, um, I'd like you to give us your introductory statement and we'll go through all th three of you and then we'll go into the poll. Michael, please. Yeah, thanks. So welcome everyone. Uh, nice to still have t so many people with us. So I'm Michael, I'm co-founder and CEO of TWICE. Um, we are the leading provider of battery analytics software. And what this essentially means and what it does, um, I'll explain in the next minute. So yesterday and today we talked a lot about um, batteries, right? And battery and cell development. Um, and there typically a lot of testing of physical cells uh, is involved. But essentially with our software, we also can reduce the amount of testing and speed up time to market with our simulation models. So then, like the last days, we also talked about um, going from the development phase, uh, so the start of the battery life cycle, directly to the end of the life cycle, and that typically <coughs> is recycling, um, or perhaps like repurposing in the field of um, second life of batteries. So essentially, with, um, for that um, use case, we also can provide with our software, in the end, a tool uh, how you decide whether you want to directly recycle a battery, if you can repurpose it, if you can use it in a stationary storage, let's say, and how long you still can use it. But what we actually haven't talked much about the last two days is actually the in-life phase, so kind of the middle part of the battery life cycle, right? And this is essentially the phase what we make batteries for in the beginning. And this is also where in the end, like, we help our customers, which are like um, in the mobility field, like um, operators and manufacturers of, of electric vehicles, so cars, buses, trucks, whatsoever, or stationary storage integrators and operators. So we help them with our software to monitor their, their battery systems in the field to get an understanding how they are used, how they perform in terms of electric thermal and aging behavior and ultimately to really make them last as long as possible um, while being safely and reliably operated. Well, thank you very much. Um, that gives us a lot of food for thought and we'll continue with Julian, please. Yeah, also welcome from my side and a big thanks for everybody who stayed here till the last session. Um, I didn't expect so many people here in the room, so I'm very, I'm very happy. Um, at BSF, we are creating battery materials, so-called cathode active materials. We're also selling binders. And um, we're also taking care about the entire value chain from um, recycling, sourcing of materials, to precursors for CAM, um, to the CAM material. Uh, as BASF, we are positioned in all regions. And um, as head of battery recycling uh, business management at BASF, I'm passionate about urban mining. And in particular in Europe, I think it's a, it's a great environment to get this started off and create an environment uh, which is more sustainable compared to today. Thank you, Julian. I'll hand it right over to you, Jennifer, please. So also welcome from my side. So I'm coming from uh, Svold uh, Energy Technology um, here in Europe. It's a Chinese company, um, battery manufacturer. So. Yeah, as we all know, we missed some things in the automotive sector and yeah, respectively in, in the electromobility. And um, I think it's not too late to be on a pole position. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so when we have a look on circular economy, I think we have uh, quite good ideas, quite good knowledge in the region. And um, yeah, I think we could be benchmark even there now, yeah, and not to miss again um, things which are right now on the table. Mm -hmm. Well, excellent. Um, that's a positive and optimistic note. Uh, it's not too late to quote you. Um, and I would like to um, run a poll now, if um, the technicians could put up the poll that we've prepared for you, because our aim is um, to test your optimism as well. Um, the question is, the circular battery industry will become a reality in the coming years. Do you agree, disagree, or are you still undecided? <coughs> Okay, we're up to uh, 20, 30 participants. There's many more people here. Let's get some more votes in. Please use your app. Uh, this is a very interesting result developing right now because you might remember the result is almost the same pattern as the one concerning the gigafactories. Will they become a reality by 2028? We had two-thirds um, of the audience uh, agreeing, one-quarter disagreeing, and about 10% undecided. It is the exact same result here for the circular battery industry. Very interesting. So a lot of optimism in the room, and I think it's very constructive to have that kind of optimism from so many experts uh, coming from the industry. So uh, I think that's um, very motivating. Thank you very much for participating. I think the result is robust now with uh, way over 100 particip participants. Um, yeah, no more changes there. Well, um, so what do we do with uh, these results? I think that puts uh, you guys as actors in the industry under a lot of pressure uh, because everybody's now expecting success. Um, and uh, I think you will be able to deliver this type of success. Um, uh, uh, Michael, if I could start with you. Um, how do the new technologies, like uh, the battery analytics, uh, the, the AI, of course, that everybody's talking about, uh, help the transition to green energy and to cleaner battery power in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, these days we talk a lot about AI as, as, as a new technology, right? I mean, we also have it in our name, um, so, of course, we also use it. But I think nevertheless, right, despite the whole boom around AI, um, I think it's, and especially on such a conference, it's pretty obvious uh, that we still need like a lot of domain knowledge to be successful, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we still need to really get a deep understanding about battery technologies, about uh, battery manufacturing and production um, processes. And in the end, I mean, we at TWICE um, are kind of combining these two worlds, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we are bringing together deep battery domain knowledge uh, on the one hand side. Um, as said, I mean, we have like our own laboratory where we do like measurements on, on cell module system level, um, also half cell um, measurements in order to understand uh, the electric thermal um, and aging behavior. Uh, and then we put this together with like field data um, from the batteries in the field in order to understand how batteries are really performing in real life conditions, right? And so the importance here is that we need to utilize these new technologies and the insights that we gain out of them and feed this back in the end to you, like the ones who are producing the next generation of batteries and the next generation of products in the field, right? Because, I mean, in the end, the whole transition towards electric mobility and renewable energies will only be successful uh, once batteries are also operated for a long period of time in order to reduce their CO2 fit footprint. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Um, Julian, what excites you about the battery recycling and um, to, wit to which extent do you think that the battery recycling can take place in Europe in the coming future? So for the first question there, I think there are two main drivers for, for the recycling. Uh, first of all is we're doing this change in electro to towards electromobility in order to reduce CO2 footprint. So if we would not address low CO2 in the manufacturing of batteries, we would just shift the CO2 consumption to the, let's say, mining and other stuff which you're needing to create the batteries. Re recycling offers a, 
good opportunity to reduce the CO2 consumption in the manufacturing of electrical vehicles significantly. So we have calculations showing a benefit of up, of up to a factor of five. And um, that's, I think that's for most of the people in this industry a major driver. For me, a second, maybe even more important driver is de-risking. So if you look into the value chains today, we're depending for some materials 100% from an, a single country. And in the last two years, I think, particularly in Germany, but also in other states, we have recognized that the maximum dependency on a single country can be a big danger for the entire ecosystem, for the entire economy. So looking into the current value chains, urban mining could contribute significantly to a de-risking. I don't say detachment, I say de-risking by putting some of the resources uh, into materials which are potentially in our control. Thank you, Julian. Jennifer, how does um, SVOLT deal with um, the battery recycling issue and what are your <coughs> plans for Europe and for China um, in the next years? Mm -hmm. So in China, this is already more or less established, yeah, let me say. So we have uh, uh, partnerships, we invest in recycling. Yeah, and now in Europe, we, we are just started to, to work on it. Yeah, what is the, the, the future way for us? So we have two ways. Yeah, um, one could be an internal way also in, in, in uh, internal investment yeah, to build up something which we need in, in mid-term and long-term range. Yeah. Uh, but also, uh, I think this is very important, and we, we are now looking for partners, yeah, um, external partners to, um, yeah, to secure also the capacity which we need in five, ten years uh, or more. Yeah? So this is, I think, um, um, yeah, what, what we need to, to really focus on, these partnerships. Yeah? Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you um, for this first round of uh, questions, and I'd like to start picking questions uh, that have been sent in by the um, participants here in the in, in the conference hall. Uh, we have um, um, a highly ranked and liked one that is um, directly uh, focused on um, twice. Uh, how do you price for your solution? Is it via usage, via pipeline? Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that's really my first uh, conference and talk where I get asked for pricing first and not technology. Uh, so I think, yeah, hopefully this, this is due to a lot of interest. Um, so, I mean, how do we price, right? Um, I mean, in the end, I mentioned, um, I mean, we have two kind of fundamentally different products. I mean, one is for the battery and cell development space, like simulation models. Uh, they are essentially priced uh, per model on a per model basis. Uh, we actually had, had, had a few uh, uh, flyers laying around uh, on the conference because we, like, just a couple of weeks ago released a new version of that model. Um, so it's, it's a price per model, um, typically. Um, the, the model license itself then uh, runs for a certain period of time. And there are like different model types, um, let's say, in, in, in terms differentiating, in terms of the detail of insights you want to get. Um, and then when it, when it comes to in-life um, software, uh, where we, as said, like monitor battery systems of vehicles or storages in the field, I mean, the pricing in the end is based on the battery asset value. So it's like in the range of, of some cents or like tens of cents uh, per kilowatt hour. Um, and this is also really resonating a lot with our customers since in the end, I mean, we help to like use your battery assets longer, more reliably, more safely and so on. Uh, so in the end, uh, it's also then a good ROI for you and it comes along with value directly for you. Very interesting. Um, would you guys like to comment on the pricing issue? I mean, uh, you all have to price and commercialize your services and products. Um, what's your thinking on the pricing? Would you like to comment? Um, yeah, I, so, so I think um, we, we need to invest in, in such kind of softwares which you provide, yeah. Um, I think it's... Um, in the European region, especially in Germany, yeah, so it's important to have... Um, uh, quite good um, quality rate, let me say, yeah, so quality, zero failure uh, strategy, things like this, so, and I think um, also regards to, uh, to, to a very good performance by the end of the day, um, we need to invest in such kind of things, yeah. Um, for sure, um, the package um, in the very first step will be then um, faced with higher cost, yeah, this is for sure, yeah. 
but um, over the time um, you have the benefit and it will come back. Yeah? So therefore, I think um, it's, it's the right um, uh, attention. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. I mean, as, as said, right, I mean, in the end, the ultimate goal is always extending lifetime. There's a, like a lot of levers you actually can pull. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's not promised too much when, when I say like 20% of lifetime increase is absolutely doable. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Then like a few cents per kilowatt hour get like a good, good relation, let's call it like this. Yeah. All right. Good. Um, let's move on to some of the um, external factors. Um, there's a bunch of questions and I'd like to try to tie them together basically on the area of regulation and standards. Um, one question uh, is concerned with Article 73 EU battery regulation. Um, it, does this make it mandatory to measure SOH after first life usage? How do you think will it impact the battery circular economy and the EU market? Um, and then there's also the question, perhaps we can tie them together, about introduction of European standards for battery cells, making the recycling process much, more, uh, much less complicated. Uh, what's your thinking on that? Who would like to take that? Could, uh, Julian, please. I could comment on this article. Um, I mean, we have a lot of aspects in the battery regulation, and sometimes in the first glance it doesn't appear logical to have these kind of regulations. Mm -hmm. I think most of them have been well thought through, and everybody who, who runs a battery may have a control system and may have an easy access to such kind of data. So it might be there anyhow. It's just mandatory to provide the data potentially for... Um, for reuse application or for evaluation of second life application. The challenges uh, for second life application are completely different. It's not the regulation. The challenge is, is who takes liability? How do I build it that it's robust? Um, what applications could I use it for? And um, how can I get access to the cells, which might be in a cell to pack concept not easily available? So I, I think the regulation part is not the problem here. And what about the standards? Um, European standards, will that have the potential to make things less complicated? What do you guys think? Yeah, I think in, in, within the region, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we need standards, we need regulations. Yeah, um, the question is um, in which, in which um, extent we need it. Okay. Yeah, so um, I think on the one hand could be very positively accelerating um, yeah, this, this, this kind of uh, circular economy uh, battery industry. Mm -hmm. But on, on, on the other hand, uh, we need to, to pay attention by the end of the day that we are not over-regulated over the years, yeah? because it's not um, now, uh, let me say, the end of the regulations. It's mm -hmm. just started. Mm -hmm. So, and we are in a developing phase. And uh, therefore, I think we need, uh, um, in the midterm, um, yeah, a quite a balanced regulation mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, landscape, let me say, yeah. Okay. Mm. would also suggest not to, to comment on, um, on the form factors, which have been addressed yesterday frequently uh, as the only attribute which needs to be thought through twice. Uh, but I mean, in the end, the, the owner of the battery, the guy who brings it into, into, the, into the market, as the obligation to make sure it can be recycled, it can be um, tested for reuse. So such companies will have a vast interest to keep the cost low. Um, standardization may help them. So why not keeping it to the market's decision? Mm -hmm. I, I, I personally hear what the people say because up to now nobody had these attributes in mind, like, uh, like reviews, but that could be solved potentially. And if we have, we, we should also think about not regulating too much because that could hinder innovation. Um, some companies might not be interested to work here because they would reveal trade secrets. Yeah, so, so you might have aspects in, in form factors or in the way you, you're building your batteries, which might be a challenge in the recycling, but not necessarily an unsolvable, <laughs> but which might be a trade secret. Mm -hmm. Where the aspect with the battery pass, if chemistry composition is there on a, on a percentage level plus some digits, it, re it reveals trade secrets. If it's there as an order of magnitude, it helps people downstream. So we have to really carefully balance um, in order not to, to achieve the opposite of what we're intending to do. Nice. That's always the challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some, some standardization and regulation is necessary, mm -hmm. but we should not go overboard with it. Yeah. That's the art of, of this. 
Michael. I think like to, to add one, one more thing, right? Because there so, was also the question about like uh, measuring SOH, right? And, and standardizing mm -hmm. this. And, mm -hmm. um, I think of course like some standardization is necessary there. Um, I mean, for instance, I don't know how many of you have bought like a used electric car? Probably not so much, right? Um, <laughs> one person. I don't know what, what kind of feeling you had while doing this, right? But like the people I spoke with typically, I mean, have not, so, not such a good feeling because nowadays you typically don't know what the exact state of the battery is, right? The car is used, but you can't really tell, well, is it like good or not? How long will it last, right? Often also the SOH from, from the manufacturer is like fluctuating a lot. Um, and so this is something where we need like standardization on the one hand side, but we also need solutions and transparency to the end customer to like reliably and transparently give like um, the residual value by in the end the SOH of the car. And this is for instance also uh, something where we like last year have founded um, the battery quick check um, solution or GmbH together with the TÜV Rheinland to provide such a solution for you as a, as a car owner to go to a shop floor, perform like a short test, and then get a certificate um, about the residual value of the car battery mm -hmm. and its SOH. Mm. Very nice. Yeah, that should open up the market for used EV. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Um, well, um, I would like to come uh, to uh, at least two questions uh, surrounding um, uh, location decisions uh, concerning black mass processing. Um, and um, first of all, it's more general. Um, how do you see the current state of black mass processing in the EU? And do you foresee more investment in the sector in the future? And then I can't ignore this one. It's got 12 likes, specifically on BASF. Um, uh, where will uh, you locate the blast ma black mass recycling site and what are the main factors that will affect this decision? I don't know how much you can speak about this already, but uh, uh, perhaps uh, some general thoughts on this. Yeah. Maybe um, these two questions have, have one item of potential misunderstanding. Black mass processing could be the processing of black mass or it could be the pro processing um, of black mass. Yeah? Um, so we're, we are currently building a plant in Schwarzheide, which produces from modules or from cell scrap black mass. It's going to be in operation in towards mid of next year. And we're having a network of partners who build similar plants throughout, throughout entire Europe. And uh, we're creating a network of having um, a spokes hub concept where we can have um, decentralized um, manufacturing facilities operational for us so we can have a holistic offer to our customers. Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes to the processing of the black mass towards the metals, um, we did not yet announce the um, investment as such, so I cannot speak about the location evidently. Um, we're planning a plant, that's what I can reveal. People doing link LinkedIn search associated also with a specific location because they may have seen higher so rated, and there was also a EU um, grant which was funded where a location was mentioned. Um, and finding the right place for such kind of plant is, is a tricky thing. So you have to consider logistic environment. Is green energy available because we want to go to the lowest CO2 frit footprints possible? Um, do you have sufficient, uh, do you have sufficient energy? Do you have sufficient water? Do you have sufficient um, infrastructure? Um, is it a green field? Is it a, white, uh, is it a brown field? Um, all of these factors are to be considered, and based on that, we have a preferred spot identified, which I will not reveal. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But you mentioned all the factors that are um, yeah. contributing to the decision making. I find that very interesting. Um, how do you how do we make uh, the black mass investment more lucrative? So this is the business case of it. Um, would would you like to expand on that as well? I fear it's on you on that question yeah. again. <laughs> um, my biggest concern in this environment right now is um, that since we need to catch up with East Asia, um, that it's going to be a tricky case. Of course, you can subsidize such kind of plant, so you're reducing OPEX and the business case automatically gets improved, uh, but that's not a sustainable solution in the long run. Yeah? So because we're not playing on the level playing field here with regards to EHS standards, we're not playing on a level playing field with regards to, to subsidies. We heard a lot of 
uh, IAA-related comments yesterday from, for, for incentives in the US. Um, I believe, I strongly believe that the only way to make it lucrative is having it running at a high utilization rate, and that requires feed. Um, as long as a feed is, in, um, is, is leaking to, to everywhere in the world, where maybe labor laws are not so important, or EHS standards are different, um, we're going to have an issue with creating such kind of environment. For that reason, BSF is strongly advocating um, for restricting the um, export of black mass. So we have in some countries, we have black mass and intermediates from battery recycling considered to be hazardous waste, mm -hmm. but not everywhere. Even in Germany, not everywhere, because counties decide on the classification. Mm -hmm. um, and we, are, we believe that creating a common understanding and at least within Europe, a level playing field on the classification of black mass as hazardous waste is going to pr improve the situation of um, feed security significantly. Mm -hmm. But we need the OEMs also to, to honor a de-risk supply chain and really give incentives to, to such kind of supply chain in the long run. Otherwise, we're going to be de dependent on individual countries. I believe the EU, who is strongly advocating for de-risking um, the, the EU, EU Commission, who is strongly advocating for um, the de-risking of the supply chains, will take other measures if required, if we are not able, as in industry, uh, to achieve that. So uh, political support is guaranteed, I would say. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you for taking that uh, question as well. Um, Jennifer, um, this audience here is um, very curious, um, and um, especially when it comes to site locations, uh, apparently. <laughs> Um, and the question um, that we got here with uh, nine likes is, uh, what role does the circularity in battery manufacturing play in the site selection for your future gigafactories in Germany? And what are your plans now very specifically for the site in Lauchhammer Brandenburg? Yeah, okay, so first of all, circular economy in, in, in our business is, um, the same in Lauchhammer or in Reusweiler in the Saarland region or in, in, in another region, um, in another country in the European Union. Yeah, so first of all, we would like to set standards yeah, where we, um, we, we can implement yeah, the, same, um, the same philosophy. Yeah, what, so we have one philosophy of, of the company. Um, uh, this is the first point. Um, I mean, I cannot specifically speak about the plans in Lauchama, yeah, um, for sure, yeah, so we are in the very first step right now. Um, but um, for the site selection, I mean, the, the question uh, was what, uh, which kind of role plays for us uh, uh, for the site selection. Mm -hmm. um, for sure, we look left and right which kind of partners we have, yeah, in, in which country we will implement um, um, or industrialization uh, project, yeah. So uh, this is important for us, but by the end of the day, I mean, um, what, is, uh, what is important for us to stay in Europe, yeah, to have a localization decree, mm -hmm. yeah, and um, to, to work with uh, local, um, uh, located partners, yeah, and not always uh, um, far away, even if, uh, if we are a Chinese company, yeah, for sure, there are also exchanges, the same for the supply chain, yeah, so we have already a, a good established supply chain in, for the Chinese manufacturing sites, yeah, but uh, step by step, we would like to ship it completely to, to Europe or as much as possible, yeah, over, over the next years, and um, this is, um, yeah, uh, let me say, one of the, the most important topic for us, yeah, how can we secure um, the localization here in Europe? Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So um, you would like to close the loop in Europe, um, and that is uh, actually a question uh, that came up here. When can the loop for LI batteries be closed in Europe, and how can we integrate uh, perhaps the entire value chain uh, for the recycling within Europe. Um, wh what are your thoughts about that? Okay. Um, I mean, do you want to go first on the... Yeah, maybe it's an easier yeah. one for yeah. me. So sure. I'm expecting, seeing mm. the announcement by 2026 to 2028, to have re really large-scale um, closing the loop plants, which require not only the recycling, uh, but also pecan plants and camp plants. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Michael, there's um, some of the questions geared particularly to you and your company. 
Uh, one that I would like to um, highlight right now is um, uh, what's the particular advantage that your solution offers, probably also vis-a-vis -vis others that might be available. Yeah. Uh, and then also, let's tie in the next one, the industry lacks of battery data standard. Are you working on this as data is the core of your business? Yeah. All right, so let me talk about the first one mm -hmm. a little bit, right? Um, so as said, um, in order to generate battery understanding, there are different approaches how you can do that, right? And Nowadays, everyone is talking about AI, and there are like a lot of solutions, right? And it's also very obvious when you like get all that data from the battery systems, like the battery management system, um, you put them into a cloud, right? To then like apply AI or like machine learning uh, data-based models essentially to that. We also do this as a company, um, and some of our competitors in the field um, also do this. But on the other hand side, um, we also, and I also need to say clearly, I mean, AI doesn't solve everything, right? So still nowadays, there's a high need for um, experts, for domain knowledge, for like a deep understanding in the electrochemical behavior um, of lithium iron mm -hmm. and also other battery types. And this is what we um, as a company are doing in parallel. Mm -hmm. So we have like our own facilities in Munich, a very extensive battery lab to do like measurements. Um, to quantify and, and model the electrical, um, thermal, and aging behavior of batteries. Um, and our uniqueness um, of our approach and solutions are that we are actually combining these two worlds together. So why is this an advantage, right? And I can give you like a very simple example. So when you think about developing a new battery system, right, you don't have any field data, right, um, about this battery. So you can't make things like aging predictions, life cycle predictions, so this is where we then like utilize our domain um, specific models. But then, then once these batteries come into field and start to age, these domain specific models become more and more inaccurate, right? Because you have statistics, because you have some effects of the field which you don't have in your models. And this is then when like database modeling, machine learning and AI gets an advantage. Um, and so by using both approaches, we combine them and kind of get the best of, of both worlds out. Mm -hmm. And as I said, this is also what makes us unique in the market. Mm -hmm. I'd so like to stick with this point. You mentioned um, the chemistry. What, what are some of the trends that you see in the chemistry for batteries right now? What's going on and what's intriguing you as yeah. a company? So yeah, I think, I mean, I don't want to like repeat everything of the last two days, right? I mean, we heard, <laughs> we heard a lot about like a sodium iron, obviously, solid state. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this all sounds super promising, right? Also the developments we see with lithium iron, um, with graphite, about fast charging. Um, so perhaps like, let me, let me give you one question I was asked a lot, uh, uh, especially from investors, right? When I early on started the company. So everyone was always asking, um, yeah, I mean, batteries are constantly improving, right? And they are getting better in terms of like lifetime, costs, performance. So is there still a need for your solution in five years time, right? Or are becoming batteries at some point so good that we don't need to monitor them? And I mean, this definitely isn't the case, right? I would say even because of this like super uh, rapid development we see in the space right now, there's like a bigger need for monitoring the systems in the field than ever, right? Because when you think of, I always like to com uh, compare batteries a little bit to what, what is, has happened in the software industry a couple of years ago, right? Um, when we think about like large companies also like Microsoft, um, I mean, people often say software is like a little bit banana product, right? You put it on the market, it still has some bugs, but then you fix it with updates over time. And to some extent, I would say we also probably will see this with batteries, right? Um, or have even have uh, have already seen it. When you think about companies like Tesla, right? Um, I bought like a Model 3, I think in 2019, and it was able to charge with like 75 kilowatts, right? And then I made like an update and, and suddenly I could charge with like 150 kilowatts and then like 200 after that. Um, I mean, which is like a huge change, right? And a huge benefit for me as a customer. And we also will see this with batteries that we kind of need to adapt the operating parameters while they're already in the field and we need to get like data out of the field. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is why like battery analytics is, is becoming more and more important mm -hmm. in the battery field and also especially with like new cell chemistries 
and the rapid development of batteries itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for that outlook. I, I think those are very significant trends. I'd like to get back to the issue of comparing different parts of the world in their development and uh, is, the, 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 is there a level playing field um, around the world? Um, one question here um, is um, maybe more global in perspective. Um, it goes like this. In the struggle of securing raw materials worldwide, shouldn't we be thinking of a global circular economy instead of a European-centered one or perhaps the Chinese one uh, and so forth? Um, and how could this be shaped? Um, I, I think th this is very interesting because uh, already we have global players in the industry uh, that perhaps are already further ahead and not so much thinking in different uh, geographies anymore. Uh, would you agree on that? Shall I comment? I can comment on that. So, Whoever. Um, <laughs> I, I mentioned already resilience of the value chains. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We have excess capacities for recycling in China today. That's why the Black Mars has a strong tendency to go towards East, East Asia yeah. and from there potentially to China, even though there are hurdles to be taken. Uh, same for Korea. You can say dependency on two countries, you're, you're set. But I, I don't consider this to be a resilient and sustainable value chain. Further, you have the transportation costs, which is a burden for a CO2 footprint. And then, if you look into the other requirements, which will come step by step uh, into force when it comes to regulations about supplier due diligence, do you have full transparency on where the cobalt is coming from, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there are a couple of topics which is difficult to control if you have such kind of exposure. Um, there's, there's a problem in the battery pass where uh, in, the, in the battery regulation where the uh, obligation to verify the fulfillment of our regulations is um, and difficult to do it differently it's in the authorities of the local county mm -hmm. which means if um, a province somewhere in China is invested into the main recycler or battery manufacturer in China it's the obligation of that county to control that it's facility, its own facility, is compliant with European standards. And I think there's a room for improvement mm -hmm. uh, on the, in, the, in that regard. If you look into that kind of regulation, it, it shows you that our ambition uh, for sustainable um, battery in our environment is, is not easy to enforce if you don't have local references. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Maybe one, one comment to this, yeah? I think um, if it's Clo the, the global or the regional way, it's, it's the best one. I, I, I do not want to argue, um, yeah, but um, by the end of the day, I think what, what is very important for us um, to have a, a quite uh, intelligent risk management, yeah, so um, maybe um, what would be an approach is to have both, yeah, so some sectors, yeah, where we can have it globally already, yeah, but some uh, where we need really to, to think regionally, yeah, not only um, because of sustainability goals or CO2 footprint and so on, but also from a supply chain topic, yeah, and a risk management mm -hmm. topic, yeah. So this is, I think, um, important to have in head uh, when we implement now um, further steps, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so if we're talking about supply chain um, dependencies or interdependencies um, across, uh, across the globe, and uh, there's another question that um, um, alludes to this. How do we make sure that end-of-life batteries and black mass stay in Europe um, and become a reliable supply of raw materials? Um, wh what can we do to, to, to ensure this? Is, it, is regulation the answer? Regulation is one answer. Um, a very productive, highly productive supply chain in Europe is another answer. Mm -hmm. Sorry to say, but we're going to um, have a steep learning curve and get the cost down in the entire value chain, mm -hmm. otherwise it mm -hmm. won't work. And um, I'm not sure it's going to work uh, without further measures. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to be seen, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a tough one. And, and is this intervention, if it's regulatory, will it be uh, EU level, national level, or Subnational level, you mentioned that counties play a role in this. Um, yeah, counties play a role in classification today. Okay. Uh, but there's a tendency to to have a common regulation within the EU. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think an 
at least EU related framework is required. Um, otherwise, we're going to have too much negative effects on, on the building up of the value chains. If you don't ah. trade between the countries in, in Europe, um, like some companies, uh, so like some countries striving for right now, um, then we're going to have, yeah, let's, in, in the end, a deterioration of the EU as such. Mm -hmm. mm. All right, maybe one more um, question on this field before we move on, and that is, um, uh, got seven likes. Uh, why has the downstream processing investment outweighed the investment in pre-treatment for battery recycling in the EU? Um, now, there's, I don't know if this is an hypothesis or if this is actual data. Um, probably Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous knows, but uh, uh, let's assume that that is a fact. Then how should this be addressed? Julian, it's another one for you. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw this question mm -hmm. at the very first page and I feared you would pick it mm -hmm. because I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, it. It's not specifying what exactly is the downstream processing. Is it mm -hmm. meaning CAM, PCAM? Is it meaning recycling? Is it meaning, uh, is the upstream then um, the dismantling, discharging? Is it the mechanical shredding? So it's, it's too generic for me to, mm -hmm. to give a reasonable answer. Mm -hmm. um, what you can see is that um, the more downstream you go into the value chain, the bigger the investment, the specific investment gets. Yeah, so if mm -hmm. I buy a shredder, it, it might be double digit million investment. Uh, if I buy a large scale hydro, it's going to be triple, a larger triple digit number. Mm -hmm. And if you see Lifecycle's comment about their stop plant in Rochester, it was one billion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, if you look into the specific risk in the downstream, it's tremendous compared to the upstream. And you see a lot of people being easier to say, okay, I'm going to try my best with, with a foreseeable mm -hmm. value, like a double-digit investment. Um, but it needs a multi, uh, a, a big company to, to really build, build a, a plant for one billion, right? Definitely. Huge capex, yes. Huge capex, mm -hmm. huge risk, mm -hmm. and um, the need for de-risking strategies. Okay. Well, thank you for taking that question, even though... Um, Everything has to be very brief, of course, in these Slido-type questions. It wasn't so specific, but thanks for tackling it anyway. Uh, Jennifer, um, we talked a lot about regulation, uh, legal requirements. How does SVOLT deal with all the legal requirements you're facing? Mm. So, um, yeah, good question. Um, we, we, we have the Chinese um, regulations, which are already uh, set up, yeah, and uh, we are already producing batteries in, in China, and uh, now we would like to penetrate the markets in the European um, region, and we have now this, um, well, we, we have several regulations to fulfill, yeah, but one, um, one of uh, this, what, what is most important for sure, is now the European battery regulation. Um, and um, yeah, what we see is that the, the targets in, in the European um, Union is, is, is quite higher sometimes, yeah, than in, in the Chinese uh, already running market, yeah. So, and therefore it's a challenge now to standardize this also because we would like to avoid um, um, on a regional level, yeah, so we would like to, to have this recycling uh, quotes, for example, mm -hmm. yeah, um, on, on a global level, on a global, um, um, yeah, let me say, acting company, mm -hmm. yeah, so we need this uh, to, to adapt, yeah, it's not easy because it's, um, um, yeah, as you know, the, the, the Chinese market is um, more cost competitive, mm -hmm. yeah, so, uh, and therefore we will be also faced um, with the increase of costs for sure, yeah. So therefore we need to, to analyze really um, the chain, yeah, where it makes sense then by the end of the day and where not, yeah. But as a global acting company, yeah, in, um, we need normally really to standardize more or less such kind of, of uh, uh, big uh, portions in, in, in a circular economy um, battery industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the need for standardization, a point well yep. taken, uh, and I think um, you have to have um, a, a legal or a regulatory environment uh, that, um, that uh, accommodates uh, for that need if you want to get to scale and uh, reduce cost. Um, so, um, uh, Michael, I'd like to um, pick two of the questions that are obviously geared towards 
twice. One is um, how do you leverage the data you receive from your customers to improve your algorithms for aging? And then perhaps we can tie the next one right in. How can twice extend battery lifetime? Do you work on better development of cells or do you focus on real operating data? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, let me kind of combine these two, right? Um, I mean, what do we do um, in the development phase, right? Um, as, as, as mentioned, I mean, we have like models um, and our customers can utilize this um, to extend the lifetime in a sense that, I mean, for instance, they are defining like the operating conditions of a battery system, uh, which are typically governed by the, by the battery management system, right? So like charging endpoints and so on. Um, so this is like optimization we do in the development phase, but then still uh, once the vehicles or stationary storages get into field, I mean, there are still like a lot of levers you can pull. So for instance, right, uh, we are working together with bus manufacturers and operators like Stadtwerke also. Um, and often, I mean, they are utilizing not the full capacity of the battery for like a daily, for the daily driving task, right? And then typically the question pops up, I mean, where do you then define kind of the operating window, um, the, the depths of discharge of the battery at the top, at the bottom, at the middle? So these are like these kind of questions uh, we, we help to answer or answer together with our customers. And with these kind of measures, we then can extend the lifetime. Mm -hmm. Um, so the second one, um, I mean, as you can imagine, right, um, the more data we get from the field um, and, and also actually from, from our laboratories, uh, the more sophisticated our, our algorithms get. Um, so we are constantly developing, further developing the algorithms with, with the amount of data we get, but we also further develop them um, on the domain knowledge side, right? So for instance, our sim simulation models, um, so we uh, published a new version a couple of weeks ago. Um, and this now essentially not only can tell you, I mean, how batteries are aging in terms of the result, right? So how capacity goes down and resistance goes up, but it also tells you why it actually ages in a sense of which degradation mechanisms are happening. So in terms of loss of lithium, in, loss of lithium inventory, loss of active material on the anode and cathode side, and this really gives you a detailed in-depth understanding how you then need to rework your cell design or your operation, operational conditions in order to get the best out of the battery. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for tying both of these questions together so nicely. Uh, we have one minute left, and I would like to use this one minute uh, to give you guys the opportunity to give us a famous last sentence um, uh, of, for tying everything together that you've learned from this discussion. Uh, it can be two sentences, too, if you like. Um, Julian, would you like to give it a start? Um, yeah, thank you so much for having us here. Um, I would like to encourage everybody to think back about entrepreneurial drive. Yeah. Because I heard so many complaints and uh, uncertainties and, and negative spirit here in this conference as well. Um, and I think it's the wrong perspective. The question is, what can I do with the cards I'm having in hand? Mm -hmm. And I would like to encourage everybody to, to create this future which we are currently developing and to help to contribute to the change towards EVs. Excellent. I like the entrepreneurial spirit. <laughs> Michael? Yeah. Yeah, I like it also very much. Um, can, I mean, it, for me, it felt the same, right? There was like a lot of like criticism and a lot of kind of, of, of um, yeah, not, not optimism. Let's call it like this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, I mean, we are in the middle of a huge change, right? And, and change always um, has also chance, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so I also uh, like to think more about the opportunities which it uh, essentially has. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we are like a great country, a great continent. Um, and I think like really when we are focusing more on the opportunities than on the potential downsides, we really can uh, actively steer that change and, and make, make it a, a great success. W wonderful. And um, Jennifer, you now have the opportunity and the privilege of the final sentence. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, I would like to say just let us do it, let us do it, yeah, bring it to the road, um, let us start, um, bring it to an operational level, yeah, um, I can also um, add just that it's, um, uh, it was already said that we have positive things and we have negative things and we, we saw over the last two days, yeah, that we analyzed it very good, yeah, the battery sector, we know what to do, but now it's time to start. Speed, we need speed, 
and we need operation. Wonderful closing remark. Thank you to uh, our three experts and thank you to the audience for the great questions and the great answers here.